Hello, and welcome to the Engaged Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by WCP Lawyers. Are you a lawyer? Are you also a psychopath? Despite being a psychopath, do you want to do something for good with your skills, or at least something with less of a chance of ending up in prison? If the following list of skills sound like you, then you might be right for us. Do you have enduring antisocial behavior, diminished empathy or remorse, disinhibited or bold behavior? Are you fearless? Are you cunning? Do you have high social intelligence? If this sounds like you, then give us a call and come do some good, or at least some constrained bad. So call us at 1-800-WCP-LAWS. That's again, 1-800-WCP-LAWS. White Collar Psychopathic Lawyers. The Evil Brain, What Lurks Inside a Killer's Mind by Jeffrey Kluger in Time, perfectly illustrates the questions that humans have asked for a long time about evil and its root causes. Uh, So for a long time, or as long as evil has existed, people have wondered about its source. And you don't have to be too much of a scientific reductionist to conclude that the first place to look is in the brain. There's not a thing that you've ever done, thought, or felt in your life that isn't ultimately traceable to a particular webwork of nerve cells firing in a particular way, allowing this machine that is you to function as it does. So if the machine is busted, if the operating system in your head fires in crazy ways, are you fully responsible for the behavior that follows? Well, today I speak with Jeremy Astizano about the brains of psychopaths and some com- common misunderstandings about psychopaths and uh, why they are who they are. Uh, but I'm here with Jeremy Astizano, and I think I've uh, collapsed it in enough time that I can uh, say it right live. Uh, and we're talking about psychopaths? We are, yeah. All right. Uh, so thank you for coming in. And uh, I, I asked this question of everyone, uh, what got you interested in psychopaths? So actually, I was thinking about it the other day, and I realized I went to a lecture. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to a lecture at Harvard with my grandfather when I was probably... I'd say 10 or 11 um, and it was on abnormal psychology mm-hmm. and I thought all of that was fascinating and especially psychopathy was something that sort of stood out for me I think um, humans tend to have sort of a morbid fascination with uh, with death and killing and other violent things which I, I think ends up not being the case all the time for psychopaths but it is definitely what they're known for so that's what got me into it I would say yeah well that, that's interesting and in terms of the brain what have you been finding in your research so far for psychopaths and their brains so I, th- I found it interesting that a lot of times with psychopaths, it's not so much what is activated, but what isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the time you'll see sort of a, a lack of activation in like the amygdala or, or in areas that have to do with, uh, with making moral decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll also see sort of a disconnect. So an area might activate. So you might see some activation in the left side of the amygdala, mm-hmm. but then um, the reaction that people would normally have. So if you're doing a study where... Um, you're seeing like fear recognition to faces, for example, Um, you don't end up seeing the same sort of adverse physiological signs in someone that's psychopathic um, as you would in sort of a normal participant. Um, So I found that really interesting so far. Yeah. Uh, And have you come across any research from uh, Ken Keel? I think you sent me some. Yeah, Yeah. I was looking at those recently. I'm just fascinated by his work because he took a a million and a half dollar fMRI scanner, Mm -hmm. which... I know this, as a podcast, describing things in the office is terrible, uh, but it's uh, an fMRI scanner is about the size of this office Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, like, the magnet and all of the equipment and everything, and he put it in the back of a semi-truck and uh, just rolls up into prisons with a semi-truck and scans prisoners' brains. Uh, in particular, looking for psychopaths. So actually, yeah, I have. I, I think you sent me an article or a journal article mm-hmm. about his research, and then also um, I read a book. Uh, I think sometime in high school, which I've actually uh, used in my research okay. uh, for this project, um, called "The Wisdom of Psychopaths" by Kevin Dutton, um, and I would definitely recommend it to anyone who's mm-hmm. even kind of interested, um, because I think it's 
it's it's a great read, I would say, and I think he actually does talk about um, his research, um, and yeah, no, that's that's definitely that's that's such a cool idea to bring around a, a scanner to prisons to actually get that population scanned. That's really cool. Yeah, uh, and um, in terms of uh, talking about psychopaths and, and their brain, do you think that there's some confusing topics? I think a lot of people kind of throw around psychopath, sociopath. I don't know, crazy person or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and that just confuses uh, everything across many different diagnoses. Yeah, definitely. I think psychopath is often used um, or is, is thought by many people to be synonymous with crazy person. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's not the case um, in, in a lot of ways. Psychopaths are often fairly, uh, fairly charming or, or reserved or not very obviously what we think of stereotypically as crazy. Um, their, be- their behavior can be very violent at times, and they do have a tendency to be hyper-focused and have a lack of empathy. Um, but there are also, f- there's, there's this concept which Kevin Dutton talks a lot about in his book um, about uh, functional psychopaths and uh, high, high-performing psychopaths. Um, and so these are people that have sort of the, the sliders or characteristics. He refers to them as sliders as if it's on a spectrum, which oh, okay. I think is um, yeah. probably fairly accurate. Um, so he, he refers to those... In, in relation to CEOs and lawyers mm-hmm. and military professionals that have to go into situations that are very high pressure and perform in those situations. Um, and so if they can sort of remove the stress and anxiety that they feel um, and be hyper-focused on whatever they need to accomplish, they end up being really good at it. And um, that's been shown in a, a, a little a variety of research that Dutton cites, I don't know specifically right now, but um, I thought that's that's fascinating to me as well. The idea that sort of this, this condition that's so stigmatized as something negative and something violent and something that you know, Hannibal Lecter is a yeah, psychopath. Right. Um, it, it can also be applied to sort of these high-performing professionals, and that's a totally different dynamic than most people are aware of. Yeah, I, I saw a documentary, something Fish was in the title, uh, <laughs> but it was th- that there's this high, um, higher than normal average population percentage of CEOs who yeah. fit, fit the criteria for psychopathy. Yeah. Uh, and what was it? I was, I'm lost. I'm totally going to say something. <laughs> No, I'll have to come back and, and think about it. Uh, but uh, in terms of your uh, BuzzFeed article uh, mm-hmm. on psychopathy, probably something that a lot of people would be interested in. Have you had any sort of response from friends or family or others that have seen your article? I haven't. Um, maybe just because they haven't decided to contact me. Um, but I, but so far, no. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and I, I think that if anyone were to read my BuzzFeed article, they might sort of... It, it, it doesn't follow sort of the standard... Uh, BuzzFeed format, mm-hmm. generally speaking, I think I probably included a little too much text, uh-huh. um, so it can you might sort of get lost in the weeds, and uh, not having access to the full journal article might be make it a little more confusing. Um, but I think I just sort of tried to profile a bunch of different research that's been done and is being done on uh, different aspects of uh, the neurology of psychopaths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, as you were talking my mind clicked back into gear and uh, what I was thinking of is did you come across there's a neuroscientist he kind of wrote some um, articles about himself and his experience as a psychopath researcher who in his research was like oh I these tests uh, or this brain is like a clear case of a psychopath whose is that and his research assistant's like that's your brain yeah Um, I actually I did come across that and I remember seeing him give a talk where he described that moment of he had two piles or something, yeah. and like one of them was psychopaths and one was you know control subjects. And his brain, I think, was supposed to be in the control, control subject, mm-hmm. and it seemed out of place. And he realized that it was his, and he had this moment of shock. Um, but I think that also drove him to do more research about how functional psychopaths are integrated into society. Um, and I, he, I think he has a really good TED talk, which is worth watching. That's something yeah. I can promote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, what is his name? Is um, I'm gonna blank on that as yeah, well. Yeah, it's totally escaping me. Uh, Oh, it's something funny. It's like the name of an actor, or it, it's it's someone else has the same name that is also a famous person, um, which isn't particularly helpful. But, <laughs> yeah, but I think that's true. Yeah, uh, and so uh, going forward, do you think that th- there's any new or developing areas of research in psychopathy? I I think that there probably are. I don't know if I'm aware of all of them. Mm-hmm. I, I would say, for one thing, I, I think you get a lot of uh, studies that are done sort of. Um, a little too narrowly, um, so you'll see an assessment in in either one in like one cognitive task or in one sort of dynamic of psychopathy. And because it's such a broad thing, I think it would be useful to 
sort of expand that and perform multiple analyses on any given psychopathic population or individual. Um, and I think that you'd get a lot more out of sort of sort of assessing a cognitive side of things and also testing an empathy response um, and doing sort of a multi-pronged approach to uh, psychopathy research. Mm -hmm. I think that might yield pretty interesting results, and I haven't seen that as much, which was sort of surprising to me. Yeah, and jumping into like uh, evolutionary psychology, I've seen some research, uh, and again, we're in evolutionary psychology, so we'll take it with a grain of salt, mm -hmm. uh, but some suggestions that uh, psychopaths were at an evolutionary advantage uh, over uh, kind of healthy individuals. I've also seen the same claim for individuals with uh, autism spectrum disorder, like high-functioning mm. autism spectrum disorder. That's interesting. The thought being that uh, they uh, are able to kind of get the most uh, out of the people around them for their own personal benefit, putting them in a um, kind of spot, uh, genetic for their like genetic dispersal to right. continue on and, and uh, pass those genes down. Yeah, from what I know, that makes perfect sense. Um, I think especially because psychopaths do tend to have more sexual partners and also, like I was saying earlier, can be very charming. For example, Ted Bundy, who's um, probably the most uh, well-known, violent, horrible serial killer mm -hmm. in the past hundred, I, I don't know how long, but in, in a long time, right. um, was known for being able to seduce women before he attacked them. He didn't use violent means right away necessarily. Um, and so I think that and psychopaths are incredibly, or can be incredibly manipulative. Um, so I think that from an evolutionary standpoint, it would actually make very good sense that they were they, they were at an advantage mm -hmm. in general. Yeah, and uh, my kind of last uh, general question uh, in terms of communicating uh, information about psychopaths and, and their brains, uh, do you think a lot of uh, the tropes used in movies and TV shows uh, kind of paints psychopathy in almost like a I don't know, sexy way? I, I think... Yes, um, this is maybe going to take more of a film criticism approach okay, to this yeah. question, mm -hmm. but if in, in Silence of the Lambs, for example, I think Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter is, um, again, one of the more famous uh, mm -hmm. depictions of a psychopath in, in media in general. Um, and I think that despite the fact that he isn't really the protagonist, you end up liking him by the end, despite the fact that he's this horrible person that kills people. Um, so I think that that's probably is done at a sort of weird rate, especially um, because, well, first of all, that's a pretty small percentage of the overall psychopathic population is that perfect killer archetype. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it definitely does seem to be a trend to depict that sort of exception to the rule as opposed to the general population, because I think it is more interesting and yeah. people do have that morbid fascination. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like how um, the schizophrenia model is a beautiful mind. Uh, right. somebody having these vivid uh, visual and auditory hallucinations that allow them to solve math problems and right. win Nobel Prizes uh, and at the same time, I guess, uh, fall into delusions uh, of uh, the World War II or whatever that uh, time period was, right. the Cold War. Uh, and so I think closing up uh, the podcast here, uh, do you have anything that you'd like to uh, promote? Um, I was thinking about it a little bit and I can't uh, give you a specific source to do this, but... Mm -hmm. uh, people should all donate to ALS research. Um, and I would, I would say that's something I'd like to prove. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, plug the Joe Schwartz run, uh, that's oh, cool. coming up on April 24th. I think a registration up until tomorrow, uh, you're guaranteed a t-shirt, uh, and, uh, it's taking place on Founders Green, uh, like I said, Sunday, April 24th, uh, money, uh, going towards the ALS foundation uh, for your registration. Uh, and there's a 3k run Great. associated that's with it. And, I think there's like a, a little party afterwards so yeah well that's a that's a perfect way to do that get yeah. out there and run yeah perfect and uh then last any any product or fad you think that people should know about uh i don't know if i could give you one that people don't already know about okay um yik yak's always fun yeah if, uh, if anyone hasn't heard of yik yak try yik yak <laughs> All right, uh, so Yik Yak, the anonymous um, kind of messaging yes. messaging yeah. board. Uh, and then you also mentioned earlier uh, Kevin Dutton's The Wisdom of Psychopaths. Mm -hmm. And I'll try to find out the uh, psychopathic neuroscientist uh, and link his TED Talk as well. Okay, yeah. Right. So thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. When no one else could know, be persecuted for our truth, so look into my eyes and let go. Just don't let go. I can be your mirror.
So thank you so much to Jeremy for coming in. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's such an interesting discussion and uh, also a lot of good suggestions of things to follow up if you're interested on in the topic. Uh, from uh, the TED Talk of a uh, scientist who uh, found out uh, while studying psychopaths that his brain uh, closely matched those of other psychopaths, uh, to uh, the book that uh, Jeremy recommended here, looking in my notes, uh, trying to find it, Kevin Dutton's uh, The Wisdom of Psychopaths. Uh, so lots of interesting places to follow up if this is uh, some, a topic that's interesting to you. Uh, I have uh, just two segments here left in the show. Uh, no thing from uh, Jake's Jams. I'm still doing these podcasts so close together that I, I'm kind of running out of things uh, to recommend or uh, suggest uh, to others. Uh, but I will talk about a scholar notification uh, where I talk about things that have come up in my Google notifications or my Feedly of interesting research. Uh, this is probably the first one that uh, I'm not uh, related to any of the authors. I don't know them. Um, haven't heard of them, uh, so kind of a, a far outside of uh, my particular um, group or, of co collaborators or, or, or friends uh, here in the British Journal of Clinical Psychology. Uh, it's an article entitled Deconstructing the Nature of Episodic Foresight Deficits Associated with Chronic Opiate Use uh, with the first author Mercury uh, and last author Rundell. Uh, so in uh, this study, they were uh, investigating episodic foresight in opiate users using an autobiographical interview, scene construction, and self-projection, so many of the things that I'm uh, very interested in. Uh, and they found that uh, in a group of 35 uh, opiate users and uh, 35 demographically matched controls, uh, they asked them to go through an imagination task where they're instructed to imagine and provide descriptions of an atemporal event, a plausible, self-relevant uh, future event, as well as a complete narrative, complete a narrative task. Uh, and they found consistent with the prior literature that these chronic opiate users exhibited reduced capacity for episodic foresight relative to controls. However, this study was the first to show that these deficits or these difficulties were independent of capacity for scene construction and narration. Instead, a specific impairment in self-projection into the future appears to contribute to the problems with episodic foresight seen in this clinical group. Uh, and so they concluded that deficits in self-projection into the future may be, have important implications in therapeutic environments, given that many relapse prevention strategies rely heavily on the ability to project oneself into an unfamiliar future free of problem substance abuse or substance use. Uh, so it kind of relates to some past work that I've done looking at contributions of different parts of the brain, hippocampus and uh, the prefrontal cortex, uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, at an individual's ability to project themselves into the future. We found deficits in the, both groups' uh, self-projection abilities, uh, but uh, it was in particular the frontal group was unable to or had problems projecting themselves into uh, a future. So we might see in opiate users kind of a, a greater impact on their uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex than perhaps their uh, hippocampus. Uh, not a part of the study, uh, just uh, something that uh, I'm riffing off of based on their findings. Uh, so that was scholar notifications. Uh, looking to the, uh, wrap up the show, uh, nothing in Twitter tweets or the reader mail. Uh, but in the future, you can uh, reach me on Twitter at EngagedBrain, or you can email me at EngagedBrainPodcast at gmail.com uh, with any questions or suggestions uh, we'll look to answer those questions in future episodes and if you have suggestions perhaps do an entire episode on that suggestion uh, so that's it for now uh, this has been the engage brain podcast thanks for listening and i can be your mirror yeah and i can be your mirror and i can be your mirror Compassion is a trait, is innately driving me, trying to be found when it can never leave. But the we, whether the storm, you either want to see, seven and torn, I promise we will never be. I know it's alarming for your eyes to see, but I'm here.